thank you very much. And Imka's also here, so uh, she can help help uh, spread the burden or share the burden of uh, of interesting questions. Well, it's a delight to be to be here in Toulouse uh, without Cassoulet. So I want to talk about this paper about fr framework for detection, measurement, welfare analysis of platform bias. And again, with Imka. So <clears throat> everybody in this uh, you know this seminar knows platforms and regulators. It's all on our minds. There are all kinds of headlines, and in particular. The, uh, we now have uh, laws either being contemplated or put into effect that ban self-preferencing. There are a lot of other concerns about platforms, but you know, today we want to be focusing on this question of self-preferencing that I think a lot of us have been interested in as well. Now, uh, there's a you know there's a excuse me there's a sense in which regulatory action is way out ahead of research, and I think there's a, an urgent need to 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 you know to detect and and measure the welfare consequences of self preferencing. But the thing is, identifying unwarranted self preferencing is not at all straightforward. I mean, it sounds kind of straightforward, but I think in some sense it isn't. So the basic questions that we want to address or try to address in this paper: first of all, what is self preferencing? Secondly, how might we detect it? And then third. What is its welfare cost? Or at least I, what I should say is how might we go about measuring its welfare cost? I want to be clear that this paper isn't so much about the phenomena as it is about how, how to study the phenomena, because the as you'll see as we go, the data we have are all quite imperfect. But there, there's going to be a silver lining, so don't, don't tune out just yet. <laughs> all right, so the generic setup that I think the self-preferencing question is typically about is some kind of ordered listing of products, like search search result rankings are maybe the most common kind of example, but you could also think of just the display of products on product pages. And users choose among some ranked list of products, and the platform in the background is choosing the ranks to serve some objective that might involve the welfare of consumers, the welfare of sellers, or the welfare of the platform itself. Now, self-preferencing, I'll give a vague definition now, but we'll get more specific as we go. Uh, self-preferencing arises if the platform ranks its own products higher, meaning better, uh, it's a lower number, but higher in the ranking, um, then would maximize some combination of seller and consumer surplus. So we're gonna think about self-preferencing as deviating some, some sort of frontier involving the interests of buyers and sellers. A roadmap for the 40 minute talk, maybe 35 left. First, we'll give a simple theoretical framework and then we'll give this will give us some theory based ways to think about uh, bias detection methods and we'll talk about two approaches that are uh, you know being used conditioning on observables approaches versus what we call outcome based approaches and we'll show with monte carlo evidence the advantages of the outcome based approach but to be clear it's not that one is good and one is bad it really depends on what data you can have so it's it's what we're trying to talk about here is not so much to you know to criticize but rather to point out what are the advantages if you had different kinds of data and you could do different kinds of things then we'll go to some uh, actual uh, empirical data from Amazon and, and uh, uh, Spotify and uh, Expedia to do some empirical comparisons showing how you can get conflicting results from these different approaches. And then finally, we'll implement the framework directly, estimating uh, simple versions of the structural model that gives rise to both estimates of the rank bias as well as the welfare effects of whatever bias we detect. And we will see meaningful differences across the settings that we study, which, again, is not so much about whether there's bias in the world, but rather that the, uh, uh, that the methods, I think, can reveal some interesting things. All right, so the model. Two parts to the model. Consumers are choosing among ranked products. And Better, we're going to you know, build in the idea that's both plausible and evidence-based that uh, uh, better rankings give rise to higher purchase probabilities. The platform in the background is choosing, if there are n products to rank, it's choosing among basically n factorial possible rank orderings in you know, what it chooses, how it chooses to depict the products. And in so doing, the platform is deciding, first of all, how to balance the interests of consumers versus sellers, and secondly, how much to advance its own interest at the expense of the consumers and the sellers. That's how we're gonna think about a, a division of the problem. Now, without self-preferencing, we're gonna think about search rankings, for example, leading to a welfare frontier between maximal consumer surplus and maximal producer surplus. I think where that's the, the, the producers here are the third party sellers. Of course, when there's also, you know, Amazon selling its own products, it's a producer and a platform, but whatever. With platform bias, the rankings are gonna give rise to a departure from that frontier. That's the idea. Now, before I get into the implementation, let's just say, what does one need in implementation? And what we need uh, from a demand model is a way to map product characteristics, prices, and platform chosen ranks, kind of as primitives, into the quantity sold of each product, the, therefore the revenue for each product and the total revenue from the choice set, as well as the consumer surplus from the choice set. 
there are a lot of ways one might do this. You know, again, in principle, especially if one had the right data, one might think about search models, one might think about limited information choice models. So we're going to illustrate this uh, partly for simplicity uh, of illustration and partly just because our data are, aren't maybe what we wish they were. We're going to go forward, go, you know, go forth with pretty straightforward illustrations via logit and nested logit. But again, you know, put in your favorite choice model here uh, because our idea isn't about the particular demand model. We didn't invent that. <laughs> our idea rather is how to kind of how to define self-preferencing, uh, you know, with this welfare frontier idea. Okay. So on the consumer side, uh, consumer I is going to choose among, now I just, we called it J, we called it N a minute ago, sorry about that, among J-ranked products, and the consumer I has this utility function. Now, what we've done here is we've separated out this delta J0, which we're going to call rank independent quality of the products, from the part that's causally determined by the rank location of the product, okay? So th that's, that's the causal rank effect. And... So mean utility of a product is, again, U bar J is delta J zero plus the gamma times RJ, but this rank independent mean, ut uh, mean utility is delta J zero. Now, I want to be clear. So if you think about rankings, uh, think about a search ranking or something. There are two different ways in which the rank is related to the product quality. First, there's a potentially causal impact of the rank on purchase, like as in demonstrated in Ursu's nice paper with that randomization. But there's also another aspect here, which is that the, the platform is going to rank better and unobservably better products higher as well. So big note here in a box, Delta J is also related to RJ beyond the causal effect because the platform ranks better products higher. But we do want to isolate out that causal part because that's the part which by re-ranking the, the, the platform could cause you know, different things to be sold and different degrees of uh, consumer surplus to be experienced. Okay, so outcomes depend on the ranking. We'll use capital R just to describe the whole ranking of the products. And again, in logit land, so SJ is the is you know basically the choice probability for for product J, and it's got this familiar form. I think all we're doing here with the yellow stuff is just to bring out the part that's uh, induced the causal effect induced by the rank choice, and the gross seller surplus across products going to be. P minus, now, now, let me also make a simplification that I should make clear right now. We're going to go forward pretending, and it's also true usually for our context, that price and, and, and variable profit are the same thing. So we'll talk about revenue and variable profit interchangeably, but let's realize or, or remember that in some contexts that won't be true. And so we've done a little thinking about how to deal with that problem, but it raises some, some different issues. But anyways, I'm going to start getting sloppy. Instead of writing P minus MC, uh, uh, I'll start to be talking about revenue. In any event, um, producer surplus uh, looks like this in Logit, and consumer surplus looks like this. But the point is, all of these things are manipulable by the choice of the ranking via the e to the you know uh, gamma r, because you know gamma is negative, and so the worse is the the worse is your ranking, the lower is your uh, your your purchase probability, and so forth. So the platform's ranking choice again is a big combinatorial problem. Now, we realize that this is related to some things people have been thinking about, about you know, optimal rankings, serving interests of platforms, and so forth. Um, rankings depend on the platform's disposition toward consumers versus sellers, as well as bias. Now, let's think about a couple of extremes on what we're going to call the welfare uh, frontier. Maximizing CS, now that one's kind of straightforward, because after all, this e to the gamma term, it just is a, is a, bigger, uh, a bigger markdown right? The, the worse you rank things. So if you wanted to maximize that sum and therefore maximize CS, you just put the best in the sense of highest Delta J zero products at the highest ranks. And you would just order by Delta J zero. So that one's kind of straightforward. Maximizing uh, uh, consumer surplus arises from simply ranking the products by Delta J zero. Remember Delta J zero has in it the effects of the product attributes as well as the price uh, already, like the minus alpha P in some sense in the usual model has already been subtracted out. The other uh, maximizing PS or revenue, that's a little harder, but we're going to propose that you could just rank by, uh, uh, let me just use a shorthand and say PJ times E to the delta J. Now, as it's going to turn out, that's, that's not as straightforward as it sounds, but it turns out that it works really, really well. The reason it's not as straightforward as it sounds is because, well, this, this, uh, the, this, Ranking by, uh, uh, well, uh, maybe a formula will help to, to, to describe it, but, but rather than argue against myself, let me just say we've done lots of numerical experiments and this simple approximation works really well. Okay, um, so the welfare frontier, um, ranking according to PJ times E to the delta J zero is what's going to maximize revenue or producer surplus. 
And ranking according to E to the delta J zero maximizes CS. And so this is just the downward sloping uh, uh, portion of this welfare frontier. So now what we're going to do is define essentially the supply side of this problem via uh, this, this, this function or this, this, this relationship. So IJ star is going to equal kappa 1 times the natural log of Pj plus kappa 2 times delta J uh, 0. Now, if you think about that, this is essentially, we're essentially describing uh, some family of functions that involve just ranking according to, to consumer surplus versus ranking according to some, something like P times Q. So if you think about values of kappa, if kappa 1 equals kappa 2, this is equivalent to ranking by something that's monotonically, you know, uh, monotonically uh, or monotonic with revenue, P times Q in some sense. On the other hand, if kappa 1 equals 0 and kappa 2 is positive, it's just ranking according to consumer surplus. All that matters for the ranking is, again, the quality of the products. So the way we're going to think about bias, then, is to add in another term to this supply function. So it's got a box here in this, this plus, I guess that's a psi times delta D, DJ. DJ is just an indicator for the, pro, the, the product being, let's say, a platform product. Or in other contexts, it might be a platform preferred product, you know, but whatever. It's some kind of product about which we suspect bias. So we're going to allow for, for this, uh, this additional term in the supply function that takes you off the frontier. So if psi is not equal to zero, there's bias, and it's going to change the ranking. And it's going to deliver a solution to this problem that's interior to the frontier. Okay, so something like this is just hypothetical. So it's so something interior, and then you could think about the welfare cost being the some measure of the distance between uh, that term and the frontier. Okay, so let's let's try to implement or use this idea, go from theory to bias tests. Uh, so, so the supply function and bias detection, the, the, we're going to call this the conditioning on observables approach. Now, uh, so I, you know, again, equals kappa one times natural log of price plus kappa two times delta J zero plus psi times D, and that's a, there's some error term. Now, if one were to imagine that this, this uh, supply function were both cardinal and linear, hence the joke here, but cardinal and linear, then uh, one could just write the following. It would be, that is, our supply function would be equivalent to just the rank is equal to some kappa prime times L and PJ plus some kappa two times delta uh, J zero plus some uh, uh, psi prime times D. One could regress ranks on these terms and the coefficient on DJ would, well, it would reflect bias. So this is the conditioning on observables approach through the lens of, of our setup. I think in reality, uh, the delta J zero is hard to observe because the delta J zero is, it's easy to observe if you have quantity. It's like a mean utility that you get out of a demand model. But if you don't observe quantity, then it's kind of hard. So, you know, what, what people tend to do in reality for understandable reasons is they'll run a regression of RJ zero or RJ, excuse me, on some controls X. And maybe they'll put the price in there or not. Well, that's not super important, I don't think. And then an indicator for um, the for, for platform products. And so uh, psi provides a measure of bias if X controls for all the effects, or at least that's actually too strong a statement. But if it controls and doesn't leave out uncorrelated stuff. But the thing is, uh, psi could also reflect unobserved platform brand characteristics. You know, so for example, Amazon Basics batteries might be desirable, <laughs> more desirable than their observable characteristics uh, reflect. Or less desirable, whatever. Yeah, there's some Amazon Basics products. Okay. Now the other approach. So, so again, the, just to you know, to depart from the the conditioning on observable approach, it's an utterly sensible thing to do. If, if, if as is quite typical, you can observe ranks, you can observe characteristics, and so it's. I think it's very much of interest to know, you know, whether there's differential ranks of Amazon, for example, products conditional on stuff. But there's a lingering worry that there are some unobservables that, that are also correlated with the, uh, uh, with the uh, platform dummy. The other approach, the outcome-based approach, um, you know, is, to, is to basically ask whether conditional on the ranks that platforms assign whether products sell differently. And it turns out, I think we can interpret that approach through this lens as well. If you think about a platform product, it's going to have, well, what's shown here, kappa 1 times LNP, J plus kappa 2 and so forth. It, Whereas a non-platform product is going to have the same thing without the bias term. So in the absence of bias, of course, psi is equal to zero. They'd have the same quality, expected quality. If psi is positive, then the, the platform product at the same rank would be, would be a worse product. And so if, 
if gamma, that is if the causal effect of the rank is the same for platform and non-platform products, then this gives rise to a, a kind of a very simple outcome-based test for bias. Just ask the quantity essentially pursuant to the ranking, the log quantity, stick in rank fixed effects. So conditional on rank, and again, you could control for price to be fully consistent with this framework, although I don't think it matters terribly much. Conditional on rank, do the platform and non-platform -pro products sell differently, kind of pursuant to the impact of, of their ranking on their, on their sales? Now, the outcome-based intuition, you know, with revenue maximization, the platform would assign ranks based on expected quality and better quality, uh, better products would get better ranks. And the effect of rank on sales is multiplicative. If there's no bias, you'd have the same expected sales for platform and non-platform products conditional on rank. If they're self-preferencing, you'd have a lower effect of rank on sales for platform versus non-platform products. In some ways, this slide is more intuitive than the last. All right. So implementation and data needs, and, and this is not, you know, for all the kinds of approaches we're thinking about, certainly one needs rankings and platform identifiers. And then for the conditioning on observables approach, one needs like characteristics of the products that, you know, the ones that belong in there. Uh, uh, for the outcome-based approach, one also needs to observe the outcomes that the ranks in part cause and in part are correlated with, like quantity, uh, quantity sold. To do the welfare analysis, you actually need everything above plus an ability to get causal rank estimates because in a counterfactual, you want to change ranks and say something sensible about what would happen with counterfactual ranks. Yes, so it's time for a horse race. Now, so one thing we're going to do here is a Monte Carlo simulation with for the following idea. Let's suppose that the expected sales of, well, to, to, try, to, to try to see when uh, the conditioning on observables approach works uh, versus when the uh, outcome-based approach works, or really when one, when one is vulnerable. So expected sales depend on beta x plus tau z and on, uh, and on the, uh, the rank assigned. Now, let's suppose z is observed by the platform, but not by the researcher. So platform rankings depend on x and z as well as the platform indicator. But here's the problem. The platform indicator is potentially correlated with the unobserved thing. So we can we can set up a little Monte Carlo in which we we have all these features and we can run the regressions, the conditioning on observables regressions and the outcome based regressions. So what we do is we simulate data for a range of biases, degrees of bias and a range of correlations between the unobserved product characteristics, unobserved to the researcher, observed to the platform and the, and the platform indicator itself. And you know, what we end up with is a, a sort of a pretty picture. Uh, yellow is a good color on this picture and things that aren't yellow are less good. So what this is saying is that the, the, the conditioning on observable approaches are on the left-hand side and the purple, uh, the purple, the, what those are, are uh, 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 failures to detect bias. Um, uh, uh, yeah, the, these are essentially the, the test getting it, the test getting it wrong. You know, the, the uh, uh, this is, yeah, this is all conditioning on observables. Excuse me, I, I misspoke about one thing. The whole thing is conditioning on observables. The lower right is one where there isn't anything unobserved. That is the, we assume that uh, uh, the, the Z can be controlled for and observed, the full information setup. If, uh, if we do it uh, with the outcome-based approach, uh, we see that uh, we do as well, essentially, as observing everything, even though we don't observe everything. So the right-hand side picture here, which is yellow, uh, uh, is showing us, you know, getting us results as good, essentially, as if we could observe everything, even though we can't observe everything. Okay. So again, I mean, I don't know if we needed a Monte Carlo for that. The point is unobservables could threaten one kind of test. If you could, in addition to observing ranks, also observe some outcome that the rank is meant to affect, then there's another approach available to you. So some real world illustrations, and, and we have il illustrative data, but all these data have, have uh, weaknesses to go with whatever advantages they have. One is we have the Amazon Kindle Daily Deals. What is that? What that is, is every day Amazon uh, promotes 50 eBooks uh, and they rank them and they post this ranking on a page. They also send out emails to subscribers. Now, it's an interesting context in part because Amazon is a big publisher, and so self-preferencing is a real con a potential concern, an interesting concern here. About 20% of the books that they promote are published through Amazon Direct or Amazon Publishing. So again, there's the possibility of self-preferencing. We also have the, uh, the, the Expedia hotel searches that many people have used. These are old data now from 2013. We have like 400,000 searches and 8 million listings. Now, what's interesting about these data is a bunch of the searches are randomized. 
Now, there's no self-preferencing in this context because Expedia is not a hotel company. That said, there, there might be bias with respect to chains. I don't think that's not so much a credible concern as an illustrative, uh, as an illustrative idea. Then we have Spotify New Music Friday data, which uh, I've analyzed in the past with Luis Aguiar and another person, um, <laughs> another Walt Vogel, I guess. So there we look at you know uh, 20, uh, 20 songs by country ranked each week. And there are, you know, whatever, 20,000 listings. Uh, and, and of these, about 6,600 eventually appear in the top 200 streaming songs. And the question there is, is there a possible bias with respect to the major record labels who are partial owners of Spotify? So again, it's not quite a self-preferencing context, but it is one where it's a platform that's doing stuff and you might worry about its bias. Okay. So uh, I, I'm going to talk at least about part of this. The first column, so this is the Amazon regressions. The first column is just a regression of log rank on, in this case, the preferred indicator is, is it an Amazon product? And there are a bunch of controls that we're not reporting in this table. But after accounting for stuff, Amazon products have lower, that is better ranks. So that looks like uh, self-preferencing. The second column is the is the outcome-based attempt, outcome-based approach. So what this is, is a regression of log ex post quantity on rank indicators, the price, and I forget if we have anything else in there. This one says this was negative as well. So they both indicate self-preferencing. They both indicate self, the, the, the direction of, you know, uh, of the measures are the same for this test, uh, for both Amazon tests are the same for this context. I mean, that said, the, the, the sizes of the estimated, um, the sizes are rather different, but the, uh, the, the, the directions are the same. Okay, uh, I, I, for time, I'm not gonna talk about those last two columns, although I suggested that I, that I just gave you some suggestion from them. Here's the Expedia context. So here, ranks, sorry, chains in the first column. This is again, a regression of rank on whether you're a chain and some other stuff. Ranks get worse, sorry, chains get worse, that is higher, but worse ranks. And the second column is the outcome-based approach. This again indicates, uh, 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 if anything, anti-chain bias. Um, uh, both find that chain hotels are ranked too low. Although again, the magnitudes, when you convert the magnitude of the, of the outcome-based test into a rank effect, which for which you need to make a parametric assumption about the effect of rank, you get pretty different sizes, but the same direction. Over at Spotify, now the first column shows that this is major, major label music is being preferred according to the conditioning on observables tests. And again, there's a long list of observables with funny names like danceability, because these are songs, danceability and liveness and whatever. But a lot of observables uh, uh, condition uh, conditional on those, the ranks are better for major label music. In the outcome-based approach, by contrast, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, there's bias, there appears to be bias against major label music because it streams better conditional on the rank to which it is assigned. So that we're getting different, not just different magnitudes, but different, different signs uh, from these two tests in this context. So the bottom line is that the, the field data at least provides some evidence for the Monte Carlo results and concerns about the context in which the conditioning, the, the, that there are contexts in which conditioning on observables uh, might give you the wrong answer. Okay, so structural, but again, I mean, there's no point in criticizing something uh, unless you have an alternative and you only have an alternative if you have quantity data and so forth. So we, we wanna be clear that it's not like we think that's a hopeless approach. In fact, I, I suspect you'll see us doing more stuff with that as well, but I think we just wanna understand when it's, when it's best uh, uh, applied and when, you know, when it's best justified and when not. All right, so the structural approach. So let's start with uh, the, so here we'll just do Amazon and Expedia because we don't have price data. The, the, the Spotify context doesn't have a product price. There's a subscription price. So it really is not so amenable to this, to this stuff if we want to do usual sorts of welfare analysis, but we'll do Amazon and Expedia. So at, at Amazon, um, we're going to estimate a plain logit almost without apology. Um, and, and so X is going to contain an Amazon dummy and some pre-promotion sales. And so the estimated values minus, you know, causal gamma R are going to give us our delta J zero hat. On the supply side, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the relationship between the ranks that the platform assigns to the products, the prices, and then these, these delta J zero hats. And then we'll put in the uh, platform indicator as well. OK, and we're going to think about, you know, rank ordered logit as the way to do this because we want to be, you know, uh, ordinal, not cardinal and so forth, although it's going to turn out that doesn't terribly much matter. 
So first of all, uh, the Amazon estimates. So uh, if we just you know run this uh, run this regression or do this this logit, um, we get this rank effect of minus 0 0.405, but we also want to get the what we would think of as a plausibly causal gamma. So for that, we estimate a different regression that has product fixed effects, and we make use of the fact that the same book gets promoted on different days at different ranks. So we take our product fixed effect, and when we do that, we get the causal part of the rank effect as shown here is 0.335. So I guess that should be a negative sign. Um, so, so we distinguish between this overall relationship with R and the causal part that we want to use in the counterfactuals. The supply side, we're going to do three things. First, column two is not the rank order logic. It's just the linear regression of the rank on uh, whether it's a platform product the uh, the log price and the rank independent excuse me mean utility it's it's intuitive just because well you can see the sign so if it's a platform product uh, the rank is is uh, 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 better lower lower means better that's all so confusing about ranks is worse means higher but whatever um, the platform products get uh, 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 better ranks the uh, higher prices give you better ranks and higher quality gives you better ranks now that might seem counterintuitive but remember Higher quality giving you better ranks, that makes sense. Consumers like that and it drives demand. Higher prices giving you better ranks reflects the fact, the idea that the platform likes revenue. Okay, so, so it's not it's not weird. It's, a, it's, it's only weird if the post office ran the platform. The third column is the rank order logit. And it's just, it's we use the normalization so things are positive instead of negative, but it's the same kind of results. The other thing maybe to note just is the magnitude of the estimates. Uh, the platform product in the third column has a, a coefficient of 12. Where's the other co? I mean, just think about how that's kind of big in some sense compared to the other two coefficients. And that'll maybe be more meaningful when we look at, at Expedia where everything's gonna be infinitesimal or that is the bias looking stuff's gonna be kind of in, infinitesimal. Okay, over at Expedia, we have a slightly different context. Well, on the one hand, we have micro data. So it's super cool. We have search level data, we see choices. Um, now people are confronted with a list of hotels and they look at them and maybe they choose one. So we have to do something a little bit more complicated. We're gonna do a conditional logit on what thing gets purchased if something gets purchased. And then at the upper level, we'll do uh, uh, just a straight logit on the relationship between the decision to book something and the inclusive value from the lower level. So it's a kind of a, uh, a four persons fixed, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a proper um, nested logit, but estimated in two steps. And so, but again, I should mention some, some, although these data are in some sense wonderful because they're micro data at the search level, they're also not wonderful for a variety of reasons. One of which I mentioned, they're super old. But the other thing is the data that were given away for this, this hacking contest oversampled uh, searches in which purchases took place. So you really shouldn't, I, I'm not sure you should believe uh, everything about the estimates or at least the size of some of the parameters. But that said, the estimates kind of appear to, to make sense. Uh, in the first column, you see, for example, that uh, people don't like prices. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, uh, people do like things that are better reviewed and more stars, people a little bit like chains, um, and so forth. So the, the, the estimates don't not make sense. The third and fourth columns then are again these rank order logits, and here are things you know look in many ways like they looked over at Amazon that uh, the platform likes better products, that is it likes to rank better products higher, lower but better. Sorry, the platform likes prices because it likes revenue. The platform seems to dislike chains. Now the size of this dislike, if you look at the third, fourth column, excuse me, the chain coefficient is minus 0.6. The other coefficients, you know, just think about relative magnitudes. That's pretty small compared to the other coefficients in relation to what was going on at Amazon. So I'm just trying to put in, in our heads uh, an expectation about what the pictures might look like. Okay, so what we can do with the model, we can have a little bit of fun. We can um, calculate rankings. What we can do is we can, you know, take the estimated bias and remove it and then recalculate the, what rankings the, the, the would have ensued or would have arisen if the platform had uh, psi equal to zero. So what this picture shows is three things. There's, um, there's the actual data, which is the solid line. There's the model's version of the actual data. This is the distribution of the Amazon product's ranks. And then there's the model debias. That is the thing way to the right. If one were to debias these rankings, you'd see that Amazon products would be basically at the very bottom of the heap. Okay, but uh, now, I, again, I want to issue this disclaimer. There, there, are, there are a lot of issues with these data. So this is not so much a claim about Amazon today as it, as it is a claim about the, the approach. So this is not, you know, this is not, don't take this as much in the way of evidence about Amazon. 
Over at Expedia, all three distributions look quite similar because after all, we found rather tiny bias. But one other thing, one other minor victory lap we might want to claim here is just that model actual and actual actual have very similar distributions. So that it would be distressing if that weren't true. Uh, yeah, so, but it, it, it isn't not true. So that's less distressing. Okay, then then a nice sort of place to look at the results is, is one of these uh, one of these welfare frontiers. So here's the Amazon Kindle Daily Deal data. So the, the circle is the debiased version of what we actually see. So in some sense, that's telling you how the how Amazon trades off uh, uh, consumers versus producers. And what's a little bit interesting is that it's way over over near consumer land, right? So the the uh, uh, bias, you know, another way to say it. Um, well, no, let me not do that. Just, just think about like the slope of the function at that point, or think about like what share of maximal consumer surplus is the debiased point versus what share of maximal uh, revenue. And it's much closer to maximal consumer surplus than it is to maximal revenue. The other point, though, of course, is the difference between the plus sign, which is the actual, and the debiased. And so you can see the extent to which uh, uh, actual uh, bias or the actual rankings are, in, in this case, in the second bullet, foregoing 3% of debiased CS and 5.3% of debiased producer surplus or revenue. You can also think of it relative to the um, relative to those 100% endpoints. Here it is for Expedia. You can't really see that there are two dots here <laughs> because there isn't much in the way of bias, according, you know, according to chains, or and not that we expected there to be. So again, it's an, it's an illustration that shows that maybe if there isn't bias, you don't find it. But what is a little bit interesting is that there's, again, that this thing, the circle on the frontier lives pretty close to consumers and farther from, from producers. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna come in for a landing ahead of schedule. So lots of time for, for questions. Um, so where are we? You know, we need ways to test for and evaluate bias. And many people in this Zoom room are thinking about that and, and we're thinking all, all about it together and that's great. This paper presents uh, an equilibrium framework that gives ways to compare testing approaches. And it shows the context in which the outcome-based approach is advantageous. And then we have these illustrative estimates of the model and that they give us rank biased estimates platform consumer surplus and producer surplus and the, the MR, the, the, basically the MRS between them, or at least something like that, as well as measures of the, uh, of the welfare effects. And I guess we don't need backup slides, but I do wanna say one thing, which is one of the motivations for doing this, even though we currently, I, I would say have imperfect data, is that the Digital Services Act has a provision for vetted researchers to get access to the kind of data, well, to some kind of data, we'll see in the future, but, if one had the right data, uh, it might very well be possible to implement our kind of our wish list of approaches and get answers that are both sort of transparent, but also believable. So um, we're excited about this as an approach more than we're excited about these as results, because uh, we think there's both a need and an opportunity to uh, to study to study this. OK, I'm going to I'll stop it there. I'm a few minutes early. That's because I talked fast. It was the coffee. <laughs> Thanks very much, Joel, also for keeping so well to time. Um, now over to Kiara. All right. I, I can use some of those minutes uh, and, and, and then I'll leave uh, the other minutes for, for questions. Um, thank you, Joel, uh, for, for presenting this. And thank you, Imke and Joel, for, for doing this. It's, it's a great paper. I'm literally, it's in my to-do to use it uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a project with uh, Andre Prepkin and Alex McKay. Uh, and it's a great paper because it really tries to bridge the gap between regulation and its implementation. And it doesn't do it five, 10 years later. The timeliness is, is quite impeccable. So um, I think it's particularly important that we have this paper now in the context of the Digital Markets Act, where there's a lot of apparently innocuous prohibitions, such as no self-preferencing, but then, you know, their implementation is not as straightforward. Um, so I think the major contribution of, of, of this paper is, is truly methodological. And so I want to highlight its value and, and clarify uh, you know, some where it may or may not apply um, in, in the context that we care about. So the idea I think is pretty intuitive, right? Uh, consumers derive utilities from goods, sellers derive profits. Uh, from the sale of those goods. And this creates sort of that Pareto frontier that you've seen 
where depending on the weight we assign to consumer and producer surplus, we obtain different rankings um, in which those options, those goods are presented to consumers, right? Any deviation from this frontier is a form of platform bias. So this is where the definition of bias comes in. Um, and this framework is really able to detect and, and quantify this, uh, this bias, right? This framework is also extremely appealing because it helps us make sense of two more reduced form approaches to detect bias that have already been used in, in the literature. The conditioning on, on observables approach and the outcome-based approach. Um, so the, the first, you know, the conditioning on observable approach is pretty simple, right? You regress rank on observables you have access to and a dummy for the type of products that you want to evaluate bias. And if you have a coefficient on that dummy that's different from zero, then you have bias for or against, depending on the sign, right? Um, the problem is that it's very unlikely that you have access to all the product characteristics affecting consumer's choice. And so that coefficient can be due, right? That coefficient on the dummy that you care about can be due to both unobservables or bias. Now, I don't think people who have used this approach uh, are using this as a definitive test of bias. I know at least, you know, I have used this with Andre and, and Alex, and we're very explicit in that, in that very short paper that this should not be taken as a definitive test of, of bias. So the question that I have for, for Imke and, and Joel is whether their model can actually rationalize this conditional and observables approach as a first step in the detection of bias. Why do I ask this? For, for two main reasons. The first one is that this is truly the easiest test to implement. You don't need demand, right? You only need rankings and a large chunk of observables. But this is something that can often be scraped. You don't need the collaboration of the platforms or other intricate way to collect data, right? So it's extremely appealing. The second reason is that, of course, this test is not always right. But not all errors are the same. So I would want to see, right, a better qualification of the errors that this test makes as a function, obviously, of the correlation structure between the, the unobservables and the dummy, right? For example, if it's the case that the test under uh, some correlational structures may, uh, tends to err on the side of false positives, right? meaning that it detects bias when none exists, but when it exists, it detects it, right? Well, then it could be a first step in a multi-step detection and correction process, right? And, and remember that we can get a sense of that correlational structure between the dummy and the observables. Why? Because we do have a set of observables, right, already uh, that we can progressively add to that regression. Um, the second reduced the form approach that, that the, uh, their uh, structural approach uh, rationalizes um, or evaluates is an outcome-based test, right? For which you have, you have to have data on demand. So this is a taller order, right? Um, and that's where, you know, the Digital Markets Act with, uh, with, uh, with the ability of researchers to ask data for these platforms really becomes valuable. And the idea is that conditional on the same rank, if one product has lower demand than the other, then the platform is, is biased in favor of that product. Okay, so that's, that's the intuition for that test. The second approach actually, both with Monte Carlo simulations and the more structural analysis uh, that Imke and Joel have done with Amazon and Expedia, it seems to be very closely aligned to the settings um, to, to, to give very close results to the more structural approach. So I, 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 I really sort of enjoy this because, you know, you don't, you don't need the regulators to estimate a complicated structural model. You can really do, do the outcome-based approach and, and be done, right? Um, but this brings me to the second point that I want to make, which is where these approach can or cannot be, uh, be applied. Because if we assume that the platform ignores producer surplus, Right, so we don't care about the the, the profits that sellers make. Um, then this approach is very broadly applicable. But if we allow for the platform to consider producer surplus, then the assumptions on the supply side are somewhat strong and need further explanation. I think Joel hinted at this, but I I want to sort of qualify this because 
marginal costs are assumed in the simplest form are assumed to be equal to zero and prices set before ranking takes place. So you can't change your price as a function of where your product is placed, right? Now, what kind of supply model would rationalize different prices with identical marginal costs? One that I have in mind is a Bertrand model of competition with differentiated products. But here's the catch. When the ranking of prices, uh, in that context, the ranking of prices would be consistent with the rankings of the rank independent mean utilities. And so there wouldn't be a trade-off, I think, between focusing relatively more on seller surplus or consumer surplus. There's only a trade-off to the extent to which, you know, the high prices are for products that consumers like less, right? But if the high prices are for products that consumers like more, right, you don't have that trade-off. And, and so, you know, to the extent that there is a trade-off, I would like to try and have a micro foundation for where that may arise um, with no marginal cost, right? And I think this is quite important and see I'm using Joel's uh, minutes um, because in, in this paper, the seller surplus maximizing ranking should prioritize products with high prices. But if those high prices come from higher marginal costs and if Amazon, for example, right, uh, had lower marginal costs, at a minimum, there's no double marginalization, or there may be economies of scale, a ranking prioritizing Amazon products because of lower marginal costs, right, and hence lower prices, would uh, be detected by these tests as self-preferencing when in fact it is not. And so I think a couple of, you know, these two points. One is sort of, can we qualify the errors on the condition on observables uh, test? And then thinking about where, what kind of supply side can lead to these trade-offs that you are capturing? But overall, you know, I'm I'm copying you, so thank you.